Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. I'm available for code reviews, contracting, and on-site training. Now, this episode is another episode of Will It C++? Specifically, I am going to be talking about the MIPS architecture, which was first developed in 1985, 33 years ago. So this puts it on par with many of the other things that we've discussed in our Will It C++ show. It's a little bit later. It was designed from the beginning to be a 32-bit architecture, and it has 32 general purpose registers and 32 floating point registers. The original architecture was in fact very simple. And we can actually, on Wikipedia here, browse through the various types of instructions that it had. But it's in good company. Even modern architectures like RISC-V, which is currently being developed, has a relatively simple instruction set and architecture intentionally. So we have MIPS-1, which was developed in 1985, and this continued to be developed. We have MIPS-2, which was uh, added some more instructions. MIPS continued to grow and change, and in 1998, they split it between MIPS 32 and MIPS 64. And at this point, you might be wondering why I am bringing up the MIPS architecture and what hardware I will be running it on. I recently acquired this little travel router, which has 128 megs of RAM, a 16 megabyte flash, and more importantly, is actually a MIPS processor. It is relatively easy to set up this little router for SSH access, and we can actually log into it and see exactly what we have. So I am here SSH'd into the device, and we can take a look at what it is. It is a Linux system running BusyBox. So we can use our CPU info in the PROC file system and see that this supports the MIPS-1 and MIPS-2 and MIPS-32 architectures. So this is not terribly far away from the architecture from 1985. And we've got 128 megs of RAM, which is a lot more than we would have had in 1985. But we can see here that about, let's see, 41 megs right now is currently cache of the 79 megs used. So we have something like 38 of our 125 megs actually in use. I have added a external USB drive with an extra four gigs of space on it and have used the O package utility, which is typical for these kinds of devices for installing packages to install GCC on that flash. So I can go in here and see that I've got GCC and the other associated tools that are required for working with our compiler already installed. Now, currently, none of the appropriate paths are set up for it to actually be able to find the system libraries and binaries that it needs, but that's okay. I'm going to actually leave it like this intentionally so that you can see what paths are required. So by using the standard package manager and installing GCC, we've got GCC 5.4.0. Now we can see here on the C++ compiler support page from CPP reference that with GCC 5.4, we've got some of C++ 17 features, certainly not nearly all of them, but a few, such as our has include for preprocessor conditionals and some things that were added quite early, like hexadecimal floating point literals, and here up at the top, uh, direct list initialization rules, etc. But we have basically all of C++14 available, as far as I can tell, and of course if we have all of C++14, we have all of C++11. So I would say we're at a pretty good state here with being able to use C++14 on our tiny little embedded $20 device with G++. So let's go ahead and look at an example because I know in these episodes of Will It C++, we like to see a hello world example. So I have my test.cpp here that I've already written. And this one is just a lambda that is immediately invoked that prints hello world and returns zero from main. Now, as I said before, I don't really have my paths set up. So 
we get to see here exactly what is required to actually work with a setup as I have it right now. I have needed to set the path so that it can find AS, the assembler, and I've needed to set the library path so that the C++ runtime libraries that are required by GCC can actually be found. And then I need to actually call the binary, and I am explicitly going to the path of the binary for G++ here. And I also have to explicitly set the system include path. Uh, I could have done that with I system, but I'm just doing it with dash capital I here. And we should be able to compile our hello world. Now, remember, this is a rather slow machine with only 128 megs of RAM, but we were able to compile this hello world without any kind of um, swapping or anything occurring, but we could have enabled swap if we wanted to. If you weren't paying attention here, we can see that we don't even have swap enabled at all. But it compiled hello world, and if we try to execute it, we're going to get the same kinds of errors that we saw earlier. We don't have the library path set, but we can actually see what that looks like. It is unable to find libstudc++.so.6, and that is in fact why I am doing this LD library path here. And we can execute our a.out, and we can see that we get hello world printed. So for a quick refresher, this has 128 megs of RAM. Let's go back and look at the CPU info. It seems, uh, well, we know BOGO MIPS. It's 380 BOGO MIPS. This is a random kind of assessment from the Linux kernel as to approximately how fast this actual device is. So if we were to look up the exact specific hardware that the CPU is, we can see that this is a 580 megahertz embedded processor from MediaTek. Now, I think it's worth at this point going back to the Wikipedia page on the MIPS architecture. I have gone back here specifically to the R6000 page because it had this handy chart for the list of MIPS microprocessors. It's used in the PlayStation 1, the N64, PlayStation 2. But this is particularly important to notice. All of these devices in the networking category, we've got CPUs from Qualcomm, MediaTek, TI, Broadcom, Marvel, all of these are router hardware. So there is a wide range of devices currently out there on the market that are routers that have MIPS processors in them. So this is actually fairly relevant to the real world today. And if by any chance you find yourself curious what the actual instruction set looks like and how the compiler can treat this processor, you can, in the Compiler Explorer, explicitly say dash dash target equals MIPS dash Linux. And you can play with this processor in Compiler Explorer and see what kind of results that you would get, what the compiler is able to optimize here, and what kind of instructions are available. And this is specifically with uh, Clang that you are able to do this. So, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode about a little look back about older process architectures like the MIPS from the 80s that are still actively supported by modern compilers and how they are currently used in the real world.